All right, uh, so thank you for coming. Uh, we are going to be talking about the church and politics. Uh, I debated about whether or not to call this the church and power uh, versus the church and politics because nine times out of 10, we're talking about the same thing, uh, which is in reality then the question of the kingdom of God versus the kingdoms of the world. Uh, we could take the kingdom of the world collectively, all of the nations or any one particular nation. Really, the theology behind discussing the difference between the two is the same. Whether we're talking about America today or uh, the Byzantine Empire or ancient Greece, it doesn't really matter what kind of structure, what era it was in, it's more or less the same thing. Uh, so I want to dive right in uh, with some introductory uh, foundational kind of thinking from uh, Harry Blumirez, uh, the Christian theologian. He's actually British. You'll notice that as we go along in some of the words and choices he uses. So let me start with this quote. There's no longer a Christian mind. There is still, of course, a Christian ethic, a Christian practice, a Christian spirituality. But as a thinking being, the modern Christian has succumbed, succumbed to secularization. He accepts religion, its morality, its worship, its spiritual culture, but he rejects the religious view of life, the view which sets all earthly issues within the context of, eter of the eternal, the view which relates all human problems, social, political, cultural, to the doctrinal foundations of the Christian faith, the view which sees all things here below in terms of God's supremacy and earth's transitoriness, in terms of heaven and hell. This was written in 1963, uh, and the phenomenon that he's talking about predates that by a long time. This is basically post-enlightenment in the modern era that we start to talk about. He's saying that the Christian way of thinking about everything has succumbed to a secular viewpoint. And by that, he means a viewpoint that views this life as the primary thing, this world as the primary thing that discounts spirituality, that discounts eternity, that discounts the idea of a judge of the living and the dead. All right, he's not saying that Christians don't have morality. He's not saying they don't have worship, that they don't have spiritualism, they don't pray, they don't worship. He's not saying any of that. He's saying that when we think about things in our day-to-day -day lives, in our career, in our family, in our politics, in many other areas, we're not doing so with a view to eternity. That's his uh, warning. Uh, and in his book, he goes on to explain a whole bunch of other things about the Christian mind and how the Christian mind should view things. So let's keep going with that. He's, I've got two more from him as our introduction. The second one, he says this, we have inculcated ourselves against sensitive realization of the world's evil. For we have now sufficiently secularized our minds to be in the habit of viewing the social and political setup in which we are involved as something holy or largely good in the eyes of God. We have kept alive our Christian urge to discriminate between good and evil by the convenient device of labeling our own institutions good and those of our past enemies or potential enemies as evil. We complacently absolve ourselves from passing judgment on the setup which nourishes us so comfortably, we lean back in our armchairs, toast our toes by the electric fire, turn on the radio or the telly, and indulge in the righteous pleasure of learning how much evil there is in the world elsewhere. And that's the key to that entire quote. Harry is saying that we have gotten ourselves to the point as Christians, not just here in America, uh, he was writing of England, of saying that our society, it's, it's not bad. It's pretty decent. All the evil's out there somewhere, right? Think back to the Cold War, right? Those evil Soviets versus the, the good and righteous West. Overlook our problems, focus on theirs. See the speck in our brother's eye, perhaps. We'll get back to that, that particular illusion later. And then lastly, this one right here uh, will really set us up for where we're going. Take some topic of current political importance. Try to establish in your own mind 
what is the right policy to recommend in relation to it, and do so in total detachment from any political alignment or prejudice. Form your own conclusions by thinking Christianly. So let me pause. He says, just pick a topic. Tax policy, policing, immigration, uh, foreign policy, pick any topic and try to figure out what would God's policy on this be? What would the Christian response to this be? Don't, don't think about anything else other than that. Then discuss the matter with fellow members of your congregation. The full loneliness of the thinking Christian will descend upon you. It's not that people will disagree with you. Some do and some don't. In a sense, that doesn't matter. But they will not think Christianly. They will think pragmatically, politically, but not Christianly. In almost all cases, you will find that views are wholly determined by political allegiance. Though he doesn't face it. The loyalty of the average churchman to the conservative party or to the labor party is in practical political matters prior to his loyalty to the church. Now, we could flip back to his last statement and say, those British people, how silly they are thinking that loyalty to the labor party and the conservative party comes before loyalty to their Christian ethic and to the church. You and I both know that we could substitute two other names in there and read this equally well about American political discourse. Harry is saying that often enough, if you say, I think that the right solution to this policy, this issue, this need, this problem is X, Y, and Z, your fellow Christian, when they respond, will be telling you a political answer and not a Christian answer. What the party that they prefer has told them to think rather than what the word of God has taught them to think. Uh, and that, of course, is uh, a problem. And so there is the framework of where we're going to go tonight in the next two, uh, the next two weeks. I'm going to spend a, a lot of time tonight developing the theological basis, the biblical basis for where we're supposed to be Next week, when part two, we'll look at where we have been, where the church has been in generations past. And then in the third week, we'll go to the conclusions and try to figure out where we should stand now. So let me go to Lord Acton, famously Lord Acton. Uh, you may or may not recognize the name, but you've probably heard the quote. And you've probably heard it misquoted, but that's okay. Power tends to corrupt. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. Lord Acton wrote this in the 19th century in response to the debate about papal infallibility. His response was to say, if you give any one man more power, it will corrupt him more. That is human nature from a Christian perspective, from a Judeo-Christian perspective. We are not capable of holding absolute power. The more we have, the more likely it is to corrupt us. Power, wealth, fame, all together, either one, that's the way we are. That is fallen human nature. So let's go back to the biblical example, the, temp the temptation of Jesus, wherein you know Satan offers Jesus the easy way out, right? One of his three temptations is earthly power within the system that already exists. I have dominion over every, every kingdom. I will give it to you if you but worship me. And if Jesus had taken him up on that, could he not have made the world a much better place as the king of the world? The same thing that his own people wanted of him, right? They forcibly tried to make him king. A number of times the disciples thought, are you ready to establish the kingdom? Where is the kingdom he could have made the world a better place than it ever has been or ever could be under anybody other else's leadership. No other person could have possibly ruled as well and as wisely as Jesus Christ. That was the patriotic dream of the nationalistic Jews. They wanted their Messiah to be a warrior king, to drive out the Romans, to bring in the golden age. And it would have been wonderful. But Jesus completely rejects that offer in favor of the Father's spiritual revolution and final victory, and this is the important part, 
over the earthly system. Not through it, but over it. Not conquering through it, destroying it and setting up something new. That's why in the end of the book of Revelation, we have a new heaven and a new earth. All things have been made new. You see, Jesus came to make people holy, not to make people better. He, made, he came to make, redeem this world for God, not to make it a better world. Luke 4, 5 through 8 is the text that's based upon the devil led him up to a high pal, uh, place and showed him in an instant all the kings of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all of their authority and splendor. It's been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So Jesus says, no, no, no. A better world is not my design. A redeemed world is. Keep that under in, in your thoughts as we move ahead. So what we're talking about for more or less the rest of the evening is the difference uh, that uh, Pastor Boyd talks about in his book, uh, The Myth of the Christian Nation, the difference between power over others and power under them, the difference between ruling and serving, which of course is something that Jesus talks about often with his disciples. So we ask ourselves, what is the calling of the church? Why did God set up a church? Why did Jesus establish it? Why did the Holy Spirit empower it? What is the poor purpose of this thing? Why are we here are we here to conquer kingdoms of the world through the accumulation of power and the use of force? Was the church supposed to conquer the world with the sword, or in the modern sense, with the gun? Or are we here to subvert fallen human nature by following the example of the cross, by acting uh, in self-sacrifice and service? Those are divergent paths. You cannot follow the path of the suffering servant. You cannot take up your cross and follow Jesus at the same time that you wield the sword to force other men to your path. I think we had that quote on our sign out on the road a while ago. When you pick up the sword, you put down the cross. Or some variation of. I didn't make it up. I read it somewhere. Uh, that's absolutely true. These are divergent paths between the warrior and the servant. So let's take uh, a little bit of uh, thought on that subject from Ed Dobson, Pastor Dobson wrote in Blinded by Might, I will always urge people to exercise their right as citizens through the political process. But who we are as Christians, excuse me, but we who are Christians are deluded if we think we'll change our culture slow, solely through political power. One of the major reasons the religious right failed is that they were seduced by one of the oldest temptations known to man. He's talking about the temptation that Jesus rejected the idea that power is the solution to our problems. We will return to that later when we talk about the history of, uh, of Jerry Falwell and the moral majority uh, next week. And then the second quote uh, is by Catholic priest Henry Neumann, in the name of Jesus, an important book in its own right. Uh, the temptation to consider power an apt instrument for the proclamation of the gospel is the greatest temptation of all. What makes the temptation of power so seemingly irresistible? Maybe it is that power offers an easy substitute for the hard task of love. It seems easier to be God than to love God. Easier to control people than to love people. Easier to own life than to love life. And as we move forward with scriptural references, you will see that the path that Jesus is asking us to follow as the church is absolutely the hard one. It is far harder than the call of the soldier, the general, the politician, uh, the king. Controlling, directing, forcing. That path is much easier than the one that we are called to. We will show examples. There's about 50 scripture references coming. Uh, you will see, they're not, that's not even all of them. That's just some of the most important ones. Which brings us back to this fundamental truth. The fulfillment of the will of God has never been dependent on human power. It is always advanced by the hand of God. Throughout the scriptures, example after example, the fulfillment of the will of God, the moving forward of God's purpose, has never been by the might of man. 
Psalm 33, 16 to 19 illustrates that. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance, despite all its great strength that cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, or on those whose hope is in his unfailing love to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. Of course, you could point to many examples, David and Goliath being a classic one, Moses versus Pharaoh and his, uh, and his whole empire and his army. And then, of course, succinctly, the prophet Zechariah says, uh, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. That is certainly the way in which God moves and accomplishes his will throughout the scriptures. So what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is what the church is supposed to be. And when we say kingdom of God, we mean simply all that God is doing here in this world, all of his people, whether they are affiliated with the church or not, whether it's part of the official church or not, the kingdom of God is everything that God is doing. This is what we are supposed to be and what we're supposed to do. And according to Pastor Boyd, he says, there's simply nothing invisible or hidden about the kingdom of God. It always looks like Jesus. It always has a servant quality to it. And in this fallen world in which individuals, social groups, and nations are driven by self-interest, this sort of radical, unconditional, and scandalous love is anything but invisible. When the church is looking like Jesus, when the church acts like Jesus, talks like Jesus, serves like Jesus, it's not hidden. Even if it is quietly, one-on-one -on -one working with someone, even if it's not uh, getting headlines, it's obvious to the world that what we're doing is lo living like Jesus because it sticks out like a sore thumb. Who else does this? So how does D Jesus describe it? Let's dig into this. What does the Word of God say about it? I started with how did Jesus describe it, and then I found a couple of quotes that weren't Jesus. Most of these ones are, so I had to broaden the definition out uh, to the whole Word of God. Matthew 3, 2. Jesus says that Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. He said that when he came near. The kingdom of God is tied to the presence of Jesus, tied to having Jesus in our midst. Of course, as Christians after Pentecost, because we believe in a triune God, we have the Holy Spirit in our midst. It's the same thing. Uh, chapter 13, verse 31 and 32 of Gospel of Matthew. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took out and planted in his field, though it's the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it's the largest of garden plants that becomes a tree so that birds come and perch in its branches. So the kingdom of God is something that can grow far more than, ever, than what anyone would expect, from smallness to greatness, from humble beginnings to impressive results. We'll see how as we move forward. He describes it as a kingdom entered by children, Matthew 22, 36 to 40. Truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God is something entered into with the humility and the trust and the obedience of a child not with the pride and the stubbornness and the effort of an adult. This one's a little more stunning, Matthew 21, 31. As a place more welcoming to sinners than the self-righteous. Got a picture of Zacchaeus there as an example of this. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first they answered. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. That's at the end of his parable when he was asking which son did what his father asked. The one that said he wouldn't do it and then went out and did it. The one that said he would do it and didn't do it. Well, the answer was the one that actually did it. And he's like, yeah, you're right. And the ones doing the will of the father right now are the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the quote unquote sinners, not the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the self-righteous. Jesus describes the kingdom of God as a sphere separate, separate from kingdoms and empires. 
a key verse, Matthew 22, 20 to 21. Whose image is this? Whose inscription? Caesar, they replied. Then he said to them, so give back to Caesar's what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. It's hard. We can't, we don't want to try to build too much on that, but Jesus is clearly hinting that there is a difference between God's kingdom and man's kingdom, that some things belong to our government and some things belong to God, that they do not overlap completely. And then Peter in Acts 5.29 says, uh, Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings demonstrating that the kingdom of God has an authority above human governments. So Jesus says there's something separate about it. Peter is saying there's something higher about it. And then in a more philosophical sense in John 17, 16, Jesus says they're not of this world even as I am not of it. While he, of course, was standing there living and breathing, in this world, having been born into this world, having to live a human life in this world, he says, I'm not of this world. Which, of course, brings us that famous phrase, in the world, but not of the world. And we try to understand that. Of course, John giving us the more esoteric, the more philosophical way of looking at things. So let's pause for a moment. Any questions up until this point? Uh, we're trying to determine what the kingdom of God looks like. Next, we're going to figure out uh, how we are supposed to behave as part of the kingdom. But do you have a picture of the kingdom? It looks like Jesus. It's established uh, by being like him, not by power, but by the spirit. Let's keep going. How should its people conduct themselves in the world? This is, of course, important, Matthew 22, uh, 37 to 40. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Everything that Moses wrote, count them up, hundreds of them. All of them are summed up in love the Lord your God with everything and love your neighbor as yourself. It's radical. This is a commitment deeper than anything else that we are called to have. And this one's a little rough sometimes with humility and self-awareness, Luke 18, 19 to 14. It's a little long, but bear with me. To some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even this tax collector. Wow, I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. From a distance, which of these two looked like the righteous one? The Pharisee. He came close to the, to the presence of God. He was clearly praying where the tax collector is sort of off on the side, afraid to even be noticed. This is the guy that won't come to church because he's afraid, he thinks, I, I, I don't belong there. They wouldn't welcome me or I've done too many things. This is the person who thinks that God's grace is not sufficient for him. Jesus reminds him that that person is going to become justified before God because of his repentance where the self-righteous man is in a heap of trouble. And this is a concept that we need to get because uh, it is foundational. We are to act in the kingdom of God as citizens of heaven. We see this uh, here in Ephesians 2, 17 to 19, but we also see it in Hebrews 11, 8 to 10, where we're told that Abraham considered himself a kingdom, uh, a citizen of a kingdom to come. And 1 Peter 2, 11 describes us as foreigners and aliens. Paul here says, 
He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, because we are, have access to the Father, because we are part of the family of God, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Our most important citizenship is in heaven. Written by the Apostle Paul, a Roman citizen. He had the best citizenship in the world at that day. And he said, forget it. Our citizenship is in heaven. And in Philippians 3.30, he says, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a fascinating thing. Paul, as a Roman citizen, had every advantage that he could have had. Much of the early church was composed of slaves, women, extremely poor people. It wasn't until the third century that you start to see aristocratic families joining the church and becoming Christians about the same time that we see Constantine move to make the church officially legal. For the vast majority of those people, they didn't have a problem with the idea that our citizenship is in heaven because their status in the Roman Empire wasn't anything to write home about. So let's have some commentary on what we've seen so thus far. Pastor Boyd's going to comment on a couple of the verses we just looked at. We are to remember always that our real citizenship is in heaven, that we cannot serve two masters. We'll get to that one later. Our allegiance, therefore can never be to any version of the kingdom of the world, however much better we may think it is than any other version of the kingdom of the world. So let me pause. He's saying that no matter how good your nation happens to be, whether you think it is the best place ever, it is the most prosperous, the most free, the most just, the most moral place in all of the world, and you look back in history and say, I can't see anything better than this, even if that is the case. It's still just a kingdom of the world. It's not equal to the kingdom of God. He says, preserving this alien status is not an addendum to our calling as kingdom of God citizens. It belongs to the essence of what it means to be a kingdom of God citizen. We utterly trivialize this profound biblical teaching if we associate our peculiar holiness with a pet list of religious taboos, such as smoking, drinking, dancing, gambling, and so on. No, the holiness the New Testament is concerned with is centered on being Christ-like, living in outrageous self-sacrificial love. So he's going off uh, on, a, on a related topic there and saying that our cultural preferences and doing well by them is not what God is talking about when he says, be foreigners in this world, be in the world, but not of the world. He's saying, be Christ-like, and being Christ-like means being a servant, and being self-sacrificial, and putting others above ourselves, and loving our neighbors as ourselves, and all the other things that are much more difficult than being a good citizen of the country you happen to belong to, <laughs> right? It is far easier to be considered a good citizen, whether you're an American today or any other nation, than it is to be a competent and, and uh, honor-deserving citizen of the kingdom of God. What else are we supposed to do? Well, one thing we're not supposed to do, and I picked the kitty thing because I figured that'd work for some people, uh, not conform to this world. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. There Paul is talking about the fact that we are not supposed to fit in. We're not supposed to feel and be comfortable in this world because no matter how good this particular culture or government or country may be, it still has glaring flaws when compared to the kingdom of God. It's not the same thing. And here's where the rubber really hits the road. 
How do we advance the kingdom of God? And I want you, as we look at these things, think about how these compare to how one would advance one's political ambitions. If you were a candidate or if you were a supporter of a party, any party, Bull Moose, uh, the Federalist Party, I'll pick ones that don't exist anymore. It doesn't matter to me. How one makes that party successful compared to how one makes the kingdom of God successful. And you will see that these methods would not work there. Well, first we need to seek God's kingdom and his righteousness, Matthew 6, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. So in other words, could you advance politically if you didn't make it a priority? If it was third most important thing, you actually were worried more about something else. That doesn't seem to work. Here's an important quote by Cal Thomas. Faith in Jesus, and it ought to be in Jesus, not Jesus plus or Jesus minus anything, including our agendas in politics, is not or should not be a means to any end. It is the end itself. But this presents a paradox. It is precisely when we concentrate on God's agenda that we are most useful to the world around us. It is only when our goal is heaven that we are of any earthly good. I can't read that quote, growing up as I did, without thinking about the Oak Ridge Boys, no earthly good. But he's saying the exact opposite. In that song, they said, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. But Cal Thomas is saying that when we are heavenly minded, we actually can do some earthly good. Which made me think of a uh, corollary to that. And this is one that, the, um, this is my own phraseology. You serve the United States of America best when you serve the kingdom of God most. And I don't care what it is you're doing to serve the kingdom of God. It is by necessity because you are being Christ-like and loving your neighbor and serving them. It must be something that is helping our country. We serve the kingdom of God by doing the opposite of what fallen human nature expects of us. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Is there a lot of loving their enemies and praying for them that persecute you going on? In the world of politics? In this generation or any other? You ever read the kind of things that uh, Jefferson uh, and Adams were saying about each other? It wasn't pretty. Luke 6, 35, but love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of, God, of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Boyd sums that up by saying, the character and the rule of God is manifested when instead of employing violence against his enemies to crush them, Jesus loves his enemies in order to redeem them. Imagine that, if our attitude in relation to our citizenship, in relation to our government and politics and our neighbors and our culture was that we were not trying to crush them, but to love them. That we were not interested in defeating them, but redeeming them. Imagine if that was the top priority, how much different it would be. I'm thinking a lot thinking quite a bit. Uh, if you think it wouldn't be any different, I, I'm sorry, it's not, you're wrong. Uh, it, it would be vastly different. We serve the kingdom of God through self-sacrifice. Matthew 16, 25, also John 12, 25. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me will find it. This is the guy jumping on the grenade, right? This is Steve Rogers, uh, proving he's worthy to be Captain America by throwing himself on the grenade, even though he knows it's not live. That's my one nerd thing for the evening from the MCU. Uh, I don't promise, I just thought of that one right now. They come to me as I go. Uh, 
We serve the kingdom of God best by laying down our lives for others, whether that's literally or metaphorically, uh, and through suffering. 1 Peter 2.21, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. The road to advancing the kingdom of God is filled with suffering. And with humble servants, service. Luke 22, Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors, but you're not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? It's not the one who is at the table, excuse me, is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. And then of course, John 13, 14 to 15, now that I your Lord and teacher have washed your feet. You also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. The kingdom of God is advanced through humble, servant-like service. Is that how you get to be the CEO of a company? Through humble self-effacing service through not claiming credit for just doing the best job, for helping other people with their projects, for being a team player? Is that how you get to be at the top of the heap in this world? Rich, famous, powerful, by taking time to help others? No, <laughs> no, it doesn't work that way. Uh, that is not the path. The kingdom of God is advanced through unity and love. This is Jesus' final prayer. Uh, there's something fairly parallel in 1 John 4, 8, and 9. Uh, quite a bit in 1 John, actually, about the need for love. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, uh, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. The kingdom of God is advanced when the people of God have unity. We working in that direction? in the church today? They weren't, when Harry Blumeris wrote that about the labor and the conservative parties, they were at each other's throat. Uh, it has been said, that, and it's sadly true, that the most segregated hour of American life is Sunday morning, racially segregated. You know what's happening? Politically segregated is fast becoming true as well. More and more people are picking the church that echoes their personal politics, their, per, per, their choice. Not the theology of the church, not the service of the church in the community, but the one they feel comfortable in where all of the jokes go their direction, where we're making fun of the right people, where we're quoting the right people, where we're upset about the right things, where nobody makes me feel uncomfortable, going all the way back, to that earlier thought, the echo chamber. More and more people are doing that. Uh, and I worry about that trend. I worry about an America with a red church and a blue church. Because where can the unity be? That's the church drawing farther apart. We have two fascinating things happening at the same time. We have a ecumenical movement that has been gaining steam, especially since Vatican II, where Catholics and Protestants are now seeing each other as equally in Christ. Lutherans and Methodists and Baptists are looking across that divide and saying, yeah, you know what, God's working over there too. And that is an amazing thing. But at the same time, 
red Catholics and red Lutherans and let red Methodists are saying we are on the same team and we're against blue Lutherans and blue Methodists and blue Catholics. And they're seeing their fellow Catholics or their fellow Lutherans or their fellow Methodists with whom they disagree politically as not being part of the kingdom of God. It is fascinating. I don't know what Martin Luther or Calvin or Zwingli or one of those guys would have said about this because it would have blown their minds that those things uh, were, were the most important. Maybe not so much because the Thirty Years' War was full of some weird alliances uh, uh, that were often, often about earthly power. The kingdom of God advances, this one's going to hurt, by embracing truth and rejecting slander. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices. Does that work on social media? Does that work on the primetime cable news uh, pundit shows? If we took out all the lies and slanders, what's left? If we didn't act, we weren't using anger and rage and malice, do we have anything left? Crickets, dead air, producers saying, say something. <laughs> the kingdom of God advances through peaceful and quiet lives. This is mind blowing. The kingdom of God is more effective through peaceful and quiet lives than, than through making waves. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all goodly, excuse me, godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Those two parts are related. The gospel is more easily heard from a quiet life than from one full of rancor and controversy and arguments and bitterness and all of that. I've been told a number of times over the years by people that I consider to be true Christians that they didn't feel like they were following Christ if they weren't making people mad, if they weren't regularly ticking people off and getting under people's skin and causing them to be angry. They thought that's what it meant to be in the world but not of the world, to be different, to be salt and to be light, was to be an irritant. Salt is an irritant, but that's not the way that Jesus uses the metaphor. I shake my head, uh, but I see that all the time. The kingdom of God advances by bearing each other's burdens. Romans 15, uh, paralleled in Galatians 6. We who are strong and ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves, each of us should please our neighbor for their good to build them up. Again, that is not the way that you advance in the business world, in the political world, uh, in, in the entertainment industry, by lifting other people up, by bearing their burdens, by helping them overcome their difficulties. But it is how one advances the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God advances by inviting the tax collectors and the sinners. There's Zacchaeus again. He's too good an example. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, he's a tax collector, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? They criticized Jesus, did they not? They called him a drunkard and a glutton, a glutton, someone who was friends of all things with prostitutes and tax collectors and sinners. One of the fascinating things that Ed Dobson did after he di was diagnosed with ALS, Pastor Ed Dobson, uh, and he had to give up his church. He was the pastor of Calvary Undenominational in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I've been in that church. It was next door to the campus of Cornerstone University where I went. Uh, when he had to retire, at the height of his uh, success as a pastor, that church was huge. It was one of the first megachurches. 
got a parking lot bigger than Walmart. Uh, and they were jam-packed every Sunday, multiple services. And he had to walk away from it because, because of ALS. That is a tough thing to take from God. But you know what he did? He started going out and talking to people one-on-one. -on -one. He never got to talk to people one-on-one -on -one hardly anymore. He was the pastor of a church with like 30 full-time staff members, right? He, he's more like a CEO and the star preacher. He didn't get to just sit down and talk to people. He went to bars, sat down and talked to people, spent the years that he had left working one-on-one -on -one to try to uh, help people see God's love and mercy. For him, it was an amazing eye-opener. Uh, if you ever get a chance, uh, and you can just buy it on Google or find it online, uh, read The Year of Living Like Jesus. Uh, it's a powerful book that Ed wrote. Um, and he also has a series of videos about him, his struggles with ALS. Uh, I recommend them highly. Um, I got to hear him preach in person a couple of times. It was amazing. Uh, that was years, of course, before his diagnosis. But this is the target audience. The kingdom of God advances through helping the least of these. Of course, this is extremely famous. You know this passage, do you not? But are we thinking Christianly? Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Any of those activities listed there? How, how one gets ahead in this world? Housing the homeless, clothing the naked, feeding the hungry, visiting prisoners and prisoners, going to the nursing home, going to the hospital, uh, going to the rehab center. Where, are these the places where one gets ahead in this world? Of course not. But the kingdom of God does not operate that way. I'm trying to hit you with a lot of stuff to let you see that, you know what? Our kingdom and this kingdom are not the same. Success is measured differently, achieved differently, for a different purpose. And ultimately, it comes to this. Through a ministry of reconciliation as Christ's ambassadors. This is what we're here for. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 to 20. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he was committed to, uh, and has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We're going to hit that last thought uh, in part three when we talk about the cost of embracing power as, the, as, as a church. It hinders our ability to be an ambassador. And that is what we are here for. Notice that phrase. That is tough stuff. As though God were making his appeal through us. And he is. Right? Now, every once in a while, somebody's going to open the hotel uh, uh, drawer, pull out a Gideon Bible, and the Spirit of God is going to work, and it's not going to really come through one of us. But that is the exception, not the rule. The vast majority of evangelism in the world today is, as it always has been, friendship evangelism. Family, neighbors, co-workers. 
the people you know and know, who know you because they're more likely to listen. Yes, sometimes it works with strangers. Yes, sometimes uh, it, it, it works on those random encounters, right? Sit down next to somebody on the train. You're, you're there for five hours. You have a conversation. Boom, uh, you know, the Spirit of God works. But that's not what most people come to the Lord through. Because of mom, because of grandma, because of their brother, because of their friend, because of their teacher. It's usually one of those. And that is why we are here, and that is kingdom work. We're almost to the conclusion section of this part. This is our, I believe, this might be one of our last ones. Through fighting spiritual battles and not physical ones. 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5. For though we live in this world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We do not wage war as the world does. And that can be in a literal sense uh, the, through war, war. But also in the sense through, through the way that we argue, through the way that we fight for things. The kingdom of God advances when we don't use this world's weapons. Of course, probably the most uh, known, the most well-known example of that are the nonviolent uh, protests of the civil rights movement. And at the exact same time, there was another wing of that seeking the same goals that said the way to get that is through guns. Your nonviolent path will never work. Now, in all, in all honesty, the nonviolent path has, been, has rarely ever been tried in human history. The strong, this is uh, Cal Thomas again. The strongholds and pretensions that we were just reading about can only be demolished under two conditions. One, that we don't fight with the world's weapons, yes, but with divine ones. And two, that our obedience is complete. And here is the, the key part. We have been trying to use the world's weapons of political power, and we have not been sufficiently obedient to the call of Jesus to care as he cares and do as he did. Remember how I said we've chosen the easier path? To love as Jesus loved and serve as Jesus served and do as Jesus did is the much harder way to change our culture, our country, the world. Is it not? It's slower. It's more, it requires more patience, more dedication, more sacrifice, more suffering. And now he relates this to his own experience. No wonder conservative Christians continue to run into brick walls, and you could say the same thing and change the adjective in front of Christian. How many times do the words and actions need to be said and done before we see the picture, understand the message, obey the commands? And when will we learn from previous failed efforts of the church to change society exclusively through political power? For those of you who don't know Cal Thomas's and Ed Dobson's story, they were hand in glove with Jerry Falwell in the moral majority. They were in the leadership. They were there through Reagan's election and all of that. They, they know whereof they speak. These are not guys that were losers with sour grapes. These were guys that won and then had second thoughts about it. Uh, we'll learn more about them as we go. So that's how the church, the kingdom of God, gets things done. Any questions at this point? We're going to look at uh, how we can screw it up next, as if that's a possibility. Uh, any questions about what we've covered thus far or anything this is making you think of? I need to ask because I need a drink. All right, then let's push forward. Uh, we got like 20 some more slides to go, so we're in good shape. What pitfalls must we avoid as the church and as the kingdom of God? Well, the number one, or one of the top ones, is the failure to know and accept the will of God, to be actually fighting against God instead of doing what God wants. 
the, the best example is Matthew 16. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. You know the context, don't you? This is immediately after Jesus says, Well done, Peter. I am indeed the Messiah. You're awesome. Moments later, the very next thing in the text is Peter falling flat on his face for proving that uh, his knowledge was an inch deep uh, uh, and he didn't know as much as he thought he knew. He had a different plan, not God's plan, and a different way of accomplishing it. About that, Pastor Boyd says, disciples of Jesus, and, and this, uh, I was, I was going to highlight something on this, but I would have been a whole highlight. So this is this whole quote is powerful. Disciples of Jesus aren't to act first and foremost on the basis of what seems practical or effective at securing good outcomes. Let's pause and let that sink in. We are never told to win. We are never told to succeed. We are never told to do that which has the most likelihood of any of those things. Succeeding, winning, coming in first. That's not the measure. We are to act on the basis of what is faithful to the character and reign of God, trusting that however things may appear in the short term, in the long run, God will redeem the world with such acts of faithfulness. Sometimes when we act faithfully, ethically, morally, in service, we're going to get the... Get the knocked down. We're going to lose. We're going to fail. We're going to walk away saying, well, that didn't work. That's the last time I try that. My goodness. And we learned the exact, exact long, wrong lesson there. We are called to live holy and righteous lives and trust that God is on his throne. Do we not say that? God is on his throne. God will be the judge of the living and the dead. God is the king of the universe. Do we actually believe that? That's what Harry Blumerez means by we don't think Christianly. We say we do, but we don't act as if we really believe that in the end, God will punish the wicked and reward the righteous. Because we choose practicality instead of morality. Now, this is not just about politics, right? This is about so many things in our lives, how we interact with other people, how we are at work, how we are with our family. Choosing what is practical over what is moral is not the way the kingdom of God is supposed to work. Not at all. Oswald Chambers, uh, famously in My Utmost for His Highest, wrote, The good is the enemy of the best. Because what is practical, what is, what is effective, uh, what leads to success, that's probably good. But we are not called to the good. We're called to the best, to holiness, to righteousness, to service in the name of Jesus Christ. Which makes this quote from Jerry Falwell interesting. I came to the point in my ministry when I realized I had to do certain things for the greater good of the country. That was his response when Ed Dobson, after they had been at it for a while, said, I'm having second thoughts. I thought I, thought I was called to be a minister, and here I am doing all this political stuff. And at this point, Ed Dobson was on TV all the time. He was getting interviewed and, and for magazine articles. Everything that you could hope for, for fame and recognition, people cheering him on. And he went to Falwell and said, it feels like I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing in this world. And Falwell's response, for better or for worse, was, 
I had to set that aside for the greater good. What's the greater good? What's the greater good than what he was doing as a minister of the word of God? What's greater? That's the question, the follow-up question. What's greater about this? Well, it's greater in the sense that you would have never heard of Jerry Falwell had he never embarked upon that path. He would have lived and died, and the people in his church and maybe the school, the school would have known about him, but you'd have never heard of him. But of course, that's not the point, is it? We're not called to be heard of, uh, to be someone that gets Googled. Uh, that's not the point. What else can screw up the church and the kingdom of God? Absolutely the attempt to serve two masters. Luke 16, 13, no one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. Yet it cannot serve both God and money. That's obviously true in God and money, but it's God and everything else. About that, Thomas wrote, in politics, zealotry is often seen as fanaticism. Politics is about compromise. Uh, he wrote this uh, more than 20 years ago. And goals are mostly achieved in increments. Politics and faith are irreconcilable. The former cannot tolerate zealotry. The latter cannot tolerate compromise. This is the reason that the two, when combined, become highly combustible. The goal, rather than the methods of obtaining the goal, becomes everything. It's a form of idolatry obscuring the way of God. Let me unpack that a little bit. In politics, whether it's a democracy or a monarchy or any other system, whether you uh, want to be on the Politburo in Soviet Russia, it doesn't matter what the system is. It's about the goals. How do we achieve it, right? How do we make it happen? But that's not what the kingdom of God is about. It's all about the methods. We are supposed to be process-oriented. We are supposed to be the ones that care about how you play the game. And not whether you win or lose. Because in this world, we're going to lose more than we win. We're not supposed to care. We're supposed to be okay with losing for the sake of the kingdom of God. But somewhere along the line, and we are not the first generation to do this. I can point, and we will, go uh, next week, look at different examples in the history of the church. The church decided that losing's not fun. And wouldn't it be better if we won here too? Can't we do both? Can't we win here and there? But the problem is winning here makes winning there harder and less likely and less effective. What else could happen to us that would derail our role as being uh, part of the kingdom of God? We could lose our saltiness. Matthew 5, 13, you're the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Christians that aren't Christ-like, what's the point? Isn't that what... Mahatma Gandhi said, I could have been conv convinced to be a Christian if not for all the Christians. I know I, whether he actually said that or not, a lot of people have been quoted as saying something like that, but there's a reason for that. About that, Thomas said, you can't apply the principles of a kingdom not of this world to a kingdom of this world. The purists want to apply the principles of a kingdom that knows no compromise, that's God's kingdom, to a kingdom that is all about compromise. Where politics is about power, the Christian faith is about truth. Whenever you try to mix the two, power usually wins, at least for the short haul. Is the truth always convenient? Do people want to hear the truth? Do you advance by speaking the truth <laughs> in, in the political realm, in any system. No, you don't, which is why the Soviet five-year plans were not at all based in reality, because that's not what the Politburo wanted to hear. And yet, if you think any other system's different, I've got a bridge to sell you. It's not. 
that they just were one of the worst examples of that. Pause for a moment. When I was 18, I turned 18 on the election between George Bush and Bill Clinton. That, that was my 18th birthday. On that day, I voted on my 18th birthday. It was a great day for me. At that point in my life, as uh, uh, midway through my senior year, I was very seriously considering majoring in poli-sci. Thinking about this, I cared about this issue back then, but from a different perspective. But I realized something. I real t realized two somethings. I hate asking for money. And schmoozing people at dinners night after night for money would have driven me nuts. And I had a bad habit of telling people the truth whether they wanted to hear it or not. And I realized that would end, I, I, my career would have never gotten higher than state representative. You know what I mean? The, the leadership would have hated me. Uh, they would have been, because I would have been the guy that calls out my own side when they screw up. And nobody likes that guy. Uh, <laughs> the other side quotes him, but their own side hates him. I, I made a, a better choice, I think. Uh, how else can the church fail? The folly of trying to overcome evil with evil. Here's a problem. Consider how this uh, fits within our current political dialogue. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you'll keep you heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome e by, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We doing a lot of that right now in America today, overcoming evil with good, turning the other cheek, living in peace as far as it depends on us, not taking revenge? <laughs> you see any of that? Of course not, because those things are not how you get ahead in that world, but in the kingdom of God, they are absolutely required. These are not options. These are not suggestions for followers of Jesus Christ. This is what we are supposed to be if the church is going to be effective at all in its ministry. Overcome evil with good. Don't overcome it with evil. Does God ever use evil to achieve his ends? No. If you think he does, you don't understand what God's been doing. How else can we fail? We can act apart from love. I just picked one of the verses from 1 Corinthians 13. Could have picked any of the other ones. It doesn't dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. That one fits pretty well in this topic. We can also fall victim to the schemes of the devil. Don't forget about those. It's another reason why we're fighting a different battle with different weapons. 2 Corinthians 2.11, in order that Satan might not outwit us, outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. We're not in this just against the people we call our enemies or the people we choose to make our enemies even though we shouldn't. Satan is involved in all of this as well. So what is the final victory of the church? Where is this going? I have absolutely no idea what the, the status of the United States of America will be in 200 years. Pick a random date. 100, 200, 500, no idea. Still be here? Still be a nation? No, no idea. But I absolutely know exactly where the church will be so at some point in the future. I don't know when that point will be, but I know with a certainty that we will be there. At some point in the future, God will reconcile a people called out of this world. Ephesians 1, 4 and 5, He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be a holy and blameless in His sight. In love, He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with His pleasure and will. God is bringing a people out of this world into His family. Absolutely, this is not negotiable. This is happening. It's the will of God. And what will happen at the end? 
we will find a vast throng redeemed from every nation of the world, Revelation 7, 9. 9. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. That's the destiny of the church, the destiny of the kingdom of God. And how will it happen? By triumphing over the powers and authorities of this world, Colossians 2, 13 to 15. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Why does the church and the kingdom of God advance this way? Because Jesus did. Because we're supposed to be like him. How did he overcome the world? By letting them kill him. Letting them get away with an unjust conviction. Letting them kill an innocent man. He absolutely destroyed sin and death by willingly accepting them. Powerful stuff. Uh, and remember, we're, this is what we're supposed to be imitating. So we've got a lot there. That is a lot to think about, about the kingdom of this world. How we, what it's supposed to be, what it's supposed to achieve, how we're supposed to achieve it. Take it all in. Most of those verses you're familiar with, there's some awful famous ones. So just a brief comparison. Just a few slides to compare to the kingdom of this world. This is actually what the, ch the church often looks like. Not what it's supposed to be, but what it actually looks like. In Acts 17, God describes those kingdoms. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and doesn't live in temples built by human hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everything life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. The kingdoms of this world, God sets their limits and their times and their seasons. They rise and they fall. None of them are eternal. None of them will be there at the end. They are all under his dominion. Psalm 47, for God is the king of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. And John 19, do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said, don't you realize I have power either to free you or crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Every kingdom of this world is beneath the dominion of God. And a secondary dominion, the dominion of Satan. John 12, 31, now is the time for the judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And 1 John 5, 19, echoing that, we know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. The kingdoms of, this, of, kingdoms of this world plot against the will of God in vain. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of this earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Human beings thinking that they can overthrow the will of God is laughable. My daughter just turned six this week. Uh, one of her favorite games is one that she invented called Knock You Down. 
Uh, she likes to play it with dad. I have to sit on my knees uh, in order to make it right. And she backs up about five steps and runs at me as fast as she can to knock me over. I let her win sometimes. So she says, yes, that's one for me. She keeps score and, and always seems to win. Uh, but I'm a little bit bigger than she is. I let her win. God is not in any danger of losing control of this world, of the kingdoms of this world, of their brilliant generals and leaders overthrowing his will. Never going to happen. What are human governments here for? They do have a role and a purpose under God's dominion. They are supposed to be doing something, and a little bit of it overlaps with the church, but probably not as much as we would like. They're supposed to administer justice as God's delegated authority. Romans 13, very famous passage. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities exist that have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will not be con or, excuse me, and you will be con commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath, to bring punishment on the, on the wrongdoer. Don't get me wrong, governments have a place and a purpose in God's economy, in God's plan. And they always have, for a very simple reason, right? Human nature. All right, without governments, we're Lord of the Flies. Did you have to read Lord of the Flies in high school? William Goldings, I've taught it many times. Lord of the Flies is a brilliant metaphor for human society. In the book, they say, there's no teachers, there's no police, we can do whatever we want. And for a few days, it was great. Then they set the island on fire and started murdering each other. Uh, and it didn't end well. Um, without governments, that's what we've got here. Mad Max, right? Uh, pick your post-apocalyptic uh, mumbo jumbo. Uh, the Walking Dead, whatever one you like, whatever era you're from. Uh, that's what we would have because that's human nature, unrestrained. What are they supposed to be doing? Uh, and how are they supposed to do it? First Peter says this, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. That's what they're supposed to do. Obviously they don't always do it well, but that's what they're there for. And then, very briefly, I, I, I didn't want to belabor this part. Uh, what evils are human governments prone to? We, I, again, the examples are not that hard to find. Uh, one of the things that human governments are prone to, whether modern or ancient, is looking at things in a nationalistic or tribalistic way. Us versus them. Us versus the barbarians. All right? The, the people that are in our tribe and the people out there that are not real people. Less, lesser of some way. A simple response to that is that's not the way the word of God tells us to think of anything. Galatians 3.26, in Christ Jesus you're all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, there is, there is, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That way of looking at the world is foreign to the kingdom of God. The kingdoms of this world can't help themselves. They look at their neighbors and say either that's a potential ally or a potential enemy. They categorize the world. They make alliances. And they can't help themselves but to propagandize them as subhuman. It's an old, old trick. It's been happening. Uh, the ancients did it, uh, and, and we moderns have, have uh, perfected it, made an art of it. And of course, the kingdoms of this world uh, and all the different systems, whether feudal or, or uh, an empire, it doesn't really matter, they are prone to greed and oppressing the weak, which of course we are called to be on the opposite side of. Defend the weak, 
and the fatherless uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. I don't want to get into that part of this too much uh, because we've had pretty much our, our fill of thinking for tonight. But let me just put a cap on it. What will the final end of earthly kingdoms be? Whichever ones exist when this day comes, what will be their end? Romans 8, 20 and 23, for the creation was subjected to frustration, uh, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, we have... Uh, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. All of creation is waiting for a change. Before World War I happened, there was a very strong opinion amongst the intellectuals of Europe that we were really making progress as a human race, that, that the golden age was in front of us. Science was, and agriculture and industry were all making great strides in education, and it seemed like we were getting this thing sorted out. And then, of course, they spent four years slaughtering each other. A little bit of disillusionment set in. We're not making that progress. All of creation knows that this is not the final chapter, and this is what is coming. 2 Peter 3, 7, By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. All of those nations will one day be overthrown. The good along with the bad, the ones we liked along with the ones we didn't. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven which said, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah and he will reign forever and ever. You do realize that, right? When Christ comes back and establishes his kingdom, He's doing away with all of the ways we've subdivided this world. Every level of it. And then it will end this way. A climactic battle against Christ in Revelation 20. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out and deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, and to gather them for battle. In number they are like the sand of the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them, and the devil who deceived them was thrown in the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever." They don't win. God will triumph. His kingdom will be established. It will be bloody, but it is certain. I don't know when that day is coming. I don't know how many governments will be in this world at that point. One? 278? Are we headed towards less governments or more? Who cares? It doesn't matter. Because they will fight against Christ, and they will lose. And he will finally establish one kingdom in this world with one ruler. So let's sum it up. This is my last slide. And I think this analogy works best. When we're talking about the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of men, we're talking about apples and oranges. Whether we're talking about America today or France or Soviet Russia of the days gone by or the Byzantine Empire or ancient Egypt or the city-states of the Greeks, or even tribal societies. What, pick a government, any government of any era that humans have ever had. It's an apple. Some of those apples are better than others, are they not? You prefer the taste of one more than the taste of another. Sometimes, some of them were rotten, <laughs> but some of them have worms in them. But they're all apples. They all operate by power, wealth, and fame. Whether feudalism, capitalism, or communism, that's something Karl Marx didn't understand. Set up any government you want, and it will operate the same way, by power, wealth, and fame. It can't operate any other way. It's a human government made up of human beings. It's an apple. It will operate by real politic, which is the way of saying 
Might makes right, and practicality is what we need. It will operate based on alliances. It will have enemies and friends. And it will care more about today than any other time. Every once in a while, it'll think about tomorrow. My whole life, we've been saying, the national debt's going to cripple our grandchildren. You can argue about the economic theory of that, but I've never believed that they took that seriously. Because they won't be here then. That's not the election they're going to be facing when their grandchildren are grown up. They'll be dead and gone. But that's the way human governments operate. That's why it's so hard for us to do things that have a payoff well into the future, right? These days, if we can't get a payoff in three seconds, we're looking at our phone going, come on, load, right? You don't have any patience at all. But that's the way human governments operate today, right? Contrast that to the kingdom of God, to the oranges. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I picked apples as the human kingdoms because there's a lot more readily recognizable varieties. Could have gone the other way. Uh, if you prefer apples to oranges, I don't care. Uh, I, just, I know there's more than one kind of orange, but I have no idea what they are. Um, so whether or not we're talking about the church as a whole, or Baptists, Methodists, Catholics, or we're talking about our denominations, or a particular church like this one, or Grace Lutheran down the street, or even just a house church, the Chinese house churches, or, or a church meeting just in someone's house, not formal, doesn't have any officers or bylaws, any kind of church is an orange. And in that church, it operates under these rules. The first shall be last, the greatest shall be the, the one that serves the most. Self-sacrifice is the key. Love is the means. And there is only one Lord and one faith and one baptism. That is how every church operates that is a true church. Not power, wealth, and fame. When power, wealth, and fame start operating in the church, it gets ugly. It becomes a mess. Some of our most embarrassing uh, examples of the last generation have been involved those things, have it not? And of course, sex usually as well, but uh, that wouldn't be there without the power, wealth, and fame. How do we operate? By righteousness, holiness, and letting God be the judge. And what is our time frame? Not today, not tomorrow, not our grandchildren, eternity. So that's why the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of men are not the same. There's a vast difference between the two. One is an apple and one is an orange. And as well as you may like that apple, as crunchy and tasty and loving and as great a pie as it might make, don't confuse it for an orange. That's all I got for tonight. Closing questions. I'm one minute over my, uh, my advertised time. That was uh, incredibly, uh, that's luck. <laughs> that was a lot. That's why I gave you lots of notes so you didn't have to try to write all that stuff down. Any questions at this point? Mm -hmm. Well, this is all stuff we know, right? The question is, do we know it well enough to live it, right? Most of those verses are, are ones that a lot of us have memorized. They're familiar, right? They're not, they're not esoteric readings. I didn't, I mean, I'm not pulling stuff out of the minor prophets where you're like, whoa, I don't remember that at all. It, this is, I mean, quoting Jesus a lot. So we know this. But as we started with Harry Blamirez, we're not really living this way because we're not thinking this way. We might be still getting the ethics right often enough, but we're not thinking right. And that's a path that, that's not sustainable. The longer we don't think Christianly, the further the church drifts from its purpose and its means. Other thoughts? I know, uh, you know, to love your neighbor, 
I moved three years ago. It's easy to love the neighbor beside me that goes to my church. It's yep. Uh, it's the it's the person who's not mowing his yard. It's the person that, you know, goes down the, the street. I'm going to get to mowing the yard. <laughs> Leave me alone. But, I mean, it, 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 yeah. it almost has to be almost of a will to do that, even though you don't want to do it. Yeah. It, it, we were called to do it, and you almost have to practice it mm -hmm. in order for it to become a reality. Yeah. Uh, but until you do, you find out without Christ's love within you, you can't do it. No. It's, it's an impossible. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I didn't get into that aspect of it, but we're not getting any of that done without the Holy Spirit. All right? The, none of that stuff is possible without the fruit of the Spirit uh, coming out of us. I mean, clearly. Uh, we got to get our minds looking at what the task at hand is before, when then we'll be on our knees saying, Lord, help me, I'm not getting in, I'm not going to do this, right? What do you mean Christ-like? Uh, come on, work with me, huh? Uh, but until we see clearly that we have to be Christ-like and what that entails, we can have that idolatry that says we're doing okay on our own. God's kind of lucky to have us. We're so awesome, right? And you're right, it, we make it easier when we pick and choose who we define as neighbor. When we love our neighbor as ourselves because they act like us and think like us and look like us and talk like us, and we don't know anyone who's not like us, we don't associate with them, whoever them is, with that definition changes all the time. Uh, yeah, it's a lot easier to pretend that we're loving our neighbor when we've... Uh, selectively define the neighbor. And if we go out and find the neighbor that's hard to love and make ourselves uh, get loving, uh, then that's, that's an eye-opener. Uh, absolutely. Things like cross-cultural experiences are a big help with that. Uh, finding out what it's like, uh, like in a situation you didn't grow up in uh, or one that you haven't experienced, uh, wh whatever that might be. Anything else? All right, we will wrap it up there. Next week, part two, we'll talk about uh, the history of the church and power. How's this worked out for us so far? We've been trying this uh, for 2,000 years. <laughs> it's not so good. Uh, and then, of course, part three, we'll, we'll, we'll really bring it home uh, and, and uh, uh, start talking about uh, where we need to go. So thank you for coming. I uh, appreciate you all being here. We got Oh, Shirley was here. It went the whole time and didn't crash, so that's, I'll take that. Uh, Shirley was there, so that's good. <laughs> Come on.